shining from the light in my heart As I praise my Lord right from the start Tears of joy overflowing from my eyes All the pain in the past was a blessing in disguise In the middle of the night I will supplicate to you As darkness fills the room The prayers make me feel brand new Tranquility The break of dawn comes too soon Belief in your mercy makes me feel I'll never lose Ashraqat nafsi bi nurim min fuadi Hina ma radadu ya rabba al-ibadi And uh, he actually started the initiative in September of 2022. Um, Hazik is not only the founder to this initiative, but he is also a New York State Certified Peer Specialist as well as a New York State Certified Recovery Peer Advocate. Uh, he's currently employed with New York City Health and Hospitals as a level two peer counselor. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for this information. Yes, hey, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry, working, well, putting, got working multiple hats. I'm, I was just making sure that we were live and thankfully we are live on Muslim Peer Services page. So uh, please do go to the page uh, to view it as well as share it to your respective pages so we can get some viewers um, benefiting from this wonderful conversation. My name is Zainab, Zainab Abdurrahim. I am one of the board members here at Muslim Peer Services and I was asked to fill in for um, our founder, brother of Rashan Bronson. He is still under the weather and we are hoping for a speedy recovery. Um, before we begin, uh, let's open up with um, some dua. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And dua is what we uh, say in Arabic for prayer. Um, so in the name of God Almighty, the most gracious, the most merciful. One second. Um, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqtati min lisani yafqahu qawli. Um, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. We are excited to be here in our first uh, Wellness Wednesday event. And today we're actually going to be talking a little bit about uh, recovery and addiction. Um, and we're going to, I guess, start, uh, Nairi, with just sharing the vision behind Muslim Peer Services and why uh, Brother Rashan decided to put this organization together, inshallah. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I did a little bit of an introduction. Uh, so basically, this mission uh, for Hazik was really something that he's been thinking about. He was thinking about this for a few years now, and it was really something that he was really passionate about and something that he really, really wanted to bring to the table. So basically our mission here at NPS is to create a culture of healing and wellness for all of humanity, using the guiding principles of Islam and the eight dimensions of wellness to foster the long-term recovery for those who face mental health and substance use challenges. Um, at NPS, we understand that recovery is not a one size fits all, but rather person-centered. So this was something that, um, you know, he, he's really passionate about. And like I said, we are really, really um, hoping that this will be successful, inshallah. Uh, we just wanted to share a little bit about our guest today. And what's funny is you can't see it because you can't see me. But anywho, as I digress, um, I just wanted to share a little bit about our guest today. Uh, so we do have... Um, our esteemed guest, Mr. Andrew Fairley. And Andrew um, is a person in long-term recovery and is also working as a KSAC T intern at the YMCA Counseling Service. Um, he's blessed with a unique perspective of recovery as he witnesses um, at work 
as he witnesses it, excuse me, at work personally and clinically. Andrew also works um, as, a as a project hospitality, um, at Project Hospitality as a project manager, excuse me, where he is grateful to be able to live out his proverbial 12 steps, doing what he can to help anyone in need of critical resources. Um, that is our first guest. Our second guest is also in long-term recovery and we are hoping that we are able to get his audio situated so that we are able to benefit from his lived experience. And that would be our uh, guest, Mr. Butler, who I see has disconnected, but is not here yet. Uh, Nairi, do you wanna just share a little bit about Mr. Butler? Sure. So um, Mr. Butler has been a peer counselor for about 13 years in a chemical dependency department um, in New York City Health and Hospitals. He's facilitated many NA and AA groups for years. He is also a SERPA, and he is also a recovery coach and a CASA. Awesome, awesome. We are looking forward to, to hearing from him. So now we just want to uh, share a little bit about the organizations that came together for this event. Uh, we do have uh, representatives from each organization and we will start with uh, Sean from um, TISA. Go ahead. Uh, well, I hope you guys can hear me. We can hear you just fine. <laughs> Great. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, as uh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Sean Gazala. I represent uh, the Staten Island Partnership for Community Wellness um, and the TISA Coalition. We are a coalition of about 50 or so organizations on the island that work together to um, improve the behavioral health of young people. Um, so we we don't do direct, I don't do direct service work myself, but really trying to support the many community partners, um, Andrew and his organization, you know, just one example, that are doing the hard work in trying to really um, amplify, you know, their, their efforts, get their awareness further, and try to spread, you know, um, you know, bash myths and really get the, the straight information out, right? Um, we're really trying to challenge stigma, substance use and mental health issues. There's a lot of stigma around them and that really prevents people from getting help, right? When we're, when we're hesitant, how others are going to view us, then we're not, you know, seeking out the help that we desperately need. And so um, we're glad to be here with you all um, to really, um, talk about, you know, the, inc the incredible courage it takes to um, get the help and, you know, struggle through recovery every day, because I'm sure we'll hear from folks that it, it isn't easy work, you know, it is hard work, but it's, um, you know, it's worth it for their, for the, the well-being of themselves and their their ecosystem, their family, their community. So I'll pause there and, and just really grateful to be with you all. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction, Sean. Um, and now we have uh, Sister Jamila from Beta Jama. Please introduce yourself and what your organization is about. Um, um, but um, my name is Jamila LaSalle for those who don't know me by now. I am the executive director to Beto Jamaat House of Community, which is basically um, a nonprofit organization that provides food security, mental health awareness through the arts, educational series, programs and advocacy support to the underserved families on Staten Island. Um, and um, in addition to that, I have the privilege and honor of joining forces with Muslim Peer Services and are one of the founding members amongst uh, Husniya, Zainab, and a couple of other um, uh, brothers and sisters um, uh, um, that are, I think, on here. But in any event, um, in addition to the food security, uh, our mission has just stated, we also provide mental health services to um, uh, underserved families on Staten Island as well. And hence, um, when uh, our brother, uh, Hazek, Rashawn Bronson, decided to 
um, you know, launch his baby, which was Muslim Peer Services. Um, I wasted no time, jump, you know, joining forces with him. And so now here we are having our first virtual workshop. I think that's all I got right now, Zainab. So I'm going to pass the baton back on. <laughs> Okay, great. So I think this is a great place for us to go ahead and jump into our conversation today. I just wanna make sure we do have Mr. Fairley here. Hello, welcome. Feel free to unmute yourself. How are you? I'm trying to figure out what camera I'm looking at. Oh, just look straight ahead. <laughs> How you doing? Good, how are you? Welcome. Okay, um, so I guess I'll open up the conversation just by sharing a bit of my history. Yes, um, please. I grew up in Staten Island, moved away, came back, moved away, came back, moved away, came back. Um, I was a business owner. So at 21, I opened my first business, the Aquarium Services Company. Um, then I opened up a, a retail smoke shop on wheels. And then eventually moved into an art gallery. So as you can imagine, I was doing drugs throughout this process. <laughs> uh, and it, it was very interesting for me because I was one of those people who convinced themselves that they could successfully use. Uh, everything was okay because I was paying the bills. I was losing friends. I was losing family. Uh, life was painful, but everything's okay because I have it together, right? Uh, wrong. Lost everything. Went to rehab. <laughs> came out. Uh, brand new person. Um, had some... Uh, very intense experiences in my early recovery, which led me uh, to decide to start working in this field. Uh, and it has been a, an absolute blessing. Uh, what I did want to talk about a bit, um, I just can't express how excited I am that uh, this this uh, initiative has started, Muslim Peer Services. Um, my faith was a huge part of my recovery. I actually came to my faith about six or seven months uh, after I, I got out of rehab. And for me, it, it is such a foundational part of my recovery that kind of fills all the gaps that maybe clinical recovery uh, therapy or peer recovery services like 12 foot uh, can't quite fill. And I, I've always noticed that, you know, there's really a gap in faith-based recovery options. Um, that that I've seen around the city. So um, I'm, I'm just so excited to hear that there's a new initiative like this because um, I, I, from, from a faith angle, uh, recovery is really the perfect starting place to connect back to God, uh, which is something I actually, you know, became grateful for all the mistakes I made in my life because it, it led me to that faith. So um, kudos to you. I'm, I'm so, so excited for you. I'm so excited for the people uh, that you will work with, because as I'm sure you've uh, witnessed in a clinical environment, you do have to be very, very careful about, uh, you know, speaking about faith, because you don't know what other people believe or what they're going through. Um, so an initiative like yours, it allows people to seek you out and, and come to you for some of the advice that maybe they can't get anywhere else. So that's something I'm super, super excited for. Um, one thing I, I do want to share, um, you know, going through this uh, recovery process, both personally and on the other end, uh, mm -hmm. as I'm now in training to be a clinician, I'm also a certified recovery peer advocate uh, and uh, was active for a time very, very heavily in the um, the The recovery is holistic. Uh, my personal belief is... Uh, Without an organization, without like Muslim Peer Services in your recovery uh, toolbox, that you're really not giving yourself all the options and all the outlets you need to get better. So, um, it, you know, just really cannot express enough and impress enough um, how excited I am. I, I didn't know about your organization until I was invited to come and do this. So to see you guys in action is really the part of so. Um, I know this is conversational, so I was going to pass it uh, to the next person, um, but I am here to share, I'm here to talk, and very, very excited to be here and grateful for your welcome. Thank you. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you so much. 
Yes, I finally was able to join you guys, and I thank you for inviting me. Even though I'm going through a difficult time with my family right now, but, you know, I always make sure that uh, I may be able to do service to you guys. Um, and my, by, the, by the way, my name is Anthony Butler. Um, I'm a certified recovery pay advocate. I've been certified since 2015. I'm in recovery as well. I just celebrated 10 years in recovery uh, December of last year. I work at uh, Prince County Hospital. I've been there. I was oh, I was there actually there for treatment from 2010 to 2000, off and on to 2013. Um, I've been in um, hospitals and institutions. I you know I've been a uh, um, uh, spent a lot of time in in um, detoxes and and rehab and also outpatient services. Um, I started, you know, using substance at an early age, uh, I think 13 years old. And then, you know, I, I did a little bit of everything, a little uh, cocaine, uh, marijuana, alcohol. And my primary drug became alcohol um, in my, my like, uh, my early 30s, late 20s, early 30s. Um, I've, uh, I've worked most of my life. I've done different, I worked different jobs. Um, I was able to stay in my my um substance use because I, I was a, I was a, actually I was functional even though I used I was I was a functioning addict as well as alcoholic. So I didn't think that I had much of a, a, a substance use disorder because I was able to save myself for some weird reason I was able to, to get you know get around for a few years until I actually started taking its toll on me. I um, started to create health issues, I had serious drinking problems, and, and it, it started with, with, you know, simple withdrawal symptoms, and I didn't perform my duties on my job without a drink, and then my health became at risk, and I developed uh, alcoholic hepatitis and peripheral neuropathy from drinking, and alcohol started to attack my central nervous system. It was at that point that I, my aunt took me to, to seek treatment at, at, at a hospital for a detox, chemical dependency. Uh, um, services at, at the hospital I actually work at today. Um, I talk about recovery because um, I, I, I talk about recovery and why I got into the field because I knew it was like for me to struggle with my substance use disorder. And I wanted, and when I was able to get back on my feet and improve the quality of my life, I was able to get back to the community that I serve. And the community that I serve is actually the community I actually live in right now. Um, I've, uh, I've always made it my business to do service and, and try to spread the, the people and let people know, but there's hope. We are substance use disorder. And um, I came into the field because I wanted to make a difference in other people's lives. And I started doing a lot of peer advocacy actually when I was still in my outpatient program and I started helping out my peers. Um, a lot of people that know me know I'm, I'm very resourceful. Um, and I try to connect people to not to just services at, at the clinic, but outside the clinic. I try to connect them to services in the community that, that can help them out as well. Um, and I use my knowledge that I acquired through my living experience and to build and garner relationships and trust. Um, also, um, the services that I provide as well. Is, is person centered and strength based, and I help people, you know, identify existing recovery capital to build on as far as their coping strategies. You know, like I also say, guarding a sense of trust, you know, confidence and authenticity. So that's what most people look in, and I'm pretty much like when you're when you're modeling, people look at you. Uh, for me, when I'm at work every day, I know I'm, I'm being watched by by the peers, because sometimes they look for originality, authenticity in you. And, um, but the things that I do, I do when nobody's watching anyway. For me, it's, it's all about um, being, being um, yourself at all times, you know, and also showing them the critical points of recovery and the vulnerability through the very stages of the recovery process. And sometimes I work in also what's called a essential intake unit, when people are not sure about getting treatment or, or don't show up, I try to get people to re-engage themselves and, and consider trying to change their lives. 
-hmm. you know, um, back into appropriate support services in a timely matter. Um, and also when people have reoccurrences, substance use, I try to get them to come in and get help. I've been there myself, so I know what it, I know what it, what my challenge it is to go in and get treatment when you're not sure what you want to do. Um, as far as your substance use disorder or being in denial about it, and I also provide a 12-step, uh, 12 12-step groups as well as the program mm -hmm. for people. It's more like a, um, I would say it's a, it's like a, a beginner's type of group, 12-step group. You get them introduced to the 12-step program. And maybe some people may find other ways of, of, of seeking self-help as well, but I try to I try to put that out there for them, and then also try to connect them to to um, other things out in the community they can probably tie themselves into as well for uh, for support. Because you know I try to tell them that people know that you know you can't do this this recovery process alone. You know, and I found that out because I tried to wing it at one time; it just didn't work for me until I start I started getting around. But finding myself around people that were trying to do things that I wanted to do as well. As far as my recovery process, mm. so you know, I, and what I do today is mostly is is link participants, to, you know, to to form recovery reports, educating participants about various models of recovery. Mm -hmm. I'm also doing a little education, support them, use of a uh, MAT for medication assisted treatment as well. Yes. Um, if a person needs to learn how to travel, I, I take them out traveling. I take them uh, on appointments. I don't do as much as I used to, but I used to go out of court dates, take people on appointments, help them connect them to resources, help them with their paperwork. There's, there's a whole bunch of variety of things that I, I do in, in this field. Yes, I enjoy thank you so much, it. Mr. Butler. I actually, I just want to jump in here really quickly because you, you shared so much information on the work that you do as a peer. And this is a question for both yourself and Andrew. Why was it so important after, because we know that a peer is someone that um, identifies as having lived experience. And however, a working peer is someone that has progressed in their recovery, right? So right. once you guys were a bit further progressed in your recovery, why was it so important for you to reach back into the community and support others? as um, a certified peer? And this is a question for both of you. Oh, okay. Um, I really didn't think this, this uh, I didn't think this process would really work. Uh, I, I doubted it. I think when I first kind of went to, to treatment, I kind of was looking for the mistakes. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, was, I was hopeless. I was really hopeless. Mm. But when I was able to turn my life around, I said, well, I wanted to share this with everyone else. I didn't want to leave because I felt that I would, it would be a selfish thing for me to leave and not pull people up. Mm -hmm. And my motto is to leave, leave no man behind. Mm -hmm. So I stuck around. I wanted to help people like myself. Because I, when, I when I was getting treatment, there were no peers available. I didn't wow. have peers. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it, makes a, it makes a very big difference. Mm -hmm. and, and and this and, and the peer movement is getting bigger and bigger because mm -hmm. I first became a recovery coach first while I was still in treatment, mm -hmm. and then I became a surgeon in 2015, mm -hmm. which is a, a recovery a recovery certified peer advocate. You know, I think you make such a beautiful point. Um, two things, right? You said that you were feeling hopeless and you didn't believe in the process, right? So you kind of came into this a bit skeptic, but when you saw that it actually worked for you, um, you wanted to help as many people as you can. And this is the beauty and the unique um, skill set that peers bring to the table. Same question for you, Andrew. Uh, well, I was really blessed with an experience where uh, the day after I got out of rehab, I hadn't been home in two and a half years. I moved to Florida, I came back to go into rehab, and I actually had drugs stashed in my house. So I went to an NA meeting, and uh, they said, you know, who needs help? So I raised my hand at the end of it saying, honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got drugs back in my house, and I'm afraid when I get home, I'm, I'm going to do them, right? Thinking I was sharing you know, some kind of, you know, emotional experience. And they they said, okay, where's your house? We'll come with you <laughs> and get rid of them. So uh, from day one of my recovery, I understood we can't do this alone, right? The people that have been involved in this process for longer than I was are the reason I'm here today because if they weren't there, 
I would have gone home and taken those drugs, right? So Mm -hmm. um, that kind of planted the seed in my mind um, that, you know, recovery is something that we do as a community. And what happened, you know, the 12-step model is excellent. And the 12-step, which is the one where you give back to your community, is the 12-step for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. And that reason is because we have to build our own foundation and get better before we get back, right? Right. So two very, very important we do not recover alone. We need the help of our community. We need to get back to it. But also, we need to make sure that we're solid in our recovery. We have all the support that we need to help other people. Because you can't pour from an empty cup. Wow. Thank you. You know, I, and I, again, I, I, I love your, your response. Nari, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just want to say um, thank you, both of you, for sharing your experiences. Um, One of the things that really touched me about the stories that you were saying is um, I myself now uh, am a certified peer. Um, I actually just finished. And one of the things that I thought about was, you know, I don't really have any substance abuse in terms of background. I really didn't have experience of that. However, I have a son who was on the spectrum. And one of the things that I faced growing up um, with my son was facing depression and anxiety. So that was one of the things that I knew that I can bring to the table in terms of supporting other moms who might have children who are on the spectrum and I can start helping them in their recovery process as I, I didn't really have that support growing up. We did have some people in, in the schools that sort of helped, but we didn't really have that support group within mothers. So that was something that um, really prompted me to want to take these courses as well. So thank you for sharing your stories. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions, Zaina. I'm going to yeah. ask. Yeah, I think we do. Okay. So one of the questions that we did have also was, um, can a relationship work if one person is in recovery and the other one is in denial? And this question was also really personal. Um, we I've been married with my husband for 25 years. And one of the questions that um, always come to my mind is, how do you support someone that if you're not going through this process or you don't have Uh, any issues in terms of that? How do you support them? How do you support your spouse? What are some ways that you can help them to recover um, when you really don't have an experience in that? Gareth, you can answer that. Uh, I'm Gareth Bryan. I'm a chaplain. I'm a counselor. I'm a therapist. And one of the things that I specialize in is addiction research. One of the problems that, and one of the pitfalls that people have is that people think that Addiction exclusively entails substance abuse and much like something like, um, how should I say, um, autism, just like autism is a spectrum. Addiction is a spectrum also. And oftentimes when people are going through different types of addictions, you mentioned very accurately, Nairi, how does someone help someone who's going through an addiction when they themselves are not going through an addiction? We're all going through an addiction. We all are addicted to something because the definition of addiction is a pathological or unhealthy attachment to someone or something. All of us either have dealt with addiction, are currently dealing with addiction, or at some point in our lives be dealing with addiction. And one of the most powerful addictions is the addiction of apathy, of carelessness. One of the reasons how and why people don't help others or people who are not willing to help others who are suffering from a particular addiction is because people honestly don't care. And it's something I tell people all the time. Apathy is worse than ignorance. Not caring is worse than not knowing. So to break down the barriers and the stigmas of addiction, the first thing that we have to do within ourselves as human beings, we have to self-examine. We have to introspect. How apathetic am I? How empathetic am I not towards the condition of another human being? And once we gauge that, once we look in the mirror spiritually and psycho-emotionally and gauge that, then we will be able to assist others because it's impossible for you to stand with someone and journey with someone if you don't care about them. It's impossible. So for pertaining to that, if you want to support someone as per their journey of recovery and healing from an addiction, the first thing that we have to do is that we have to actually care about the person. We have to actually want the person to recover. We have to actually want the person to be healed. 
If that's not on our bucket list, then we are of no benefit to that person. Yes, mashallah. Sorry, I'm trying to get, I can't, couldn't get my camera on fast enough, Brother Gareth. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. To, uh, to offer a perspective from the other side of that, uh, my girlfriend mm -hmm. uh, has no history of substance use, uh, substance abuse, and, and uh, what Mr. Bryant is saying is 100% correct. What helps us more than anything, what helps her support me, is when she says, I don't get it, but I care about you and I'm here to listen. And I'm telling you that that does more than fixing the problem ever could, if that makes sense, because it empowers me to work on it myself, knowing that I have the support and love of someone, whether or not they understand what I'm going through. I like to add also as well is that uh, I, you, I would have to educate my spouse about the dilemma I'm facing and try to educate them on it. I try to get people to get their, their, their loved ones and to make their others involved in a recovery um, treatment process to get a better understanding of what it's going through. Sharing information, there's groups, there's family groups you can attend like Al-Anon. Um, you get a better understanding of exactly what it takes for that person to get through what they're going through. Because some people don't really understand what it is, you know, especially in, in, in the, um, the substance use disorder uh, situation when, you know, some people still frown upon it as a moral issue when it's not. You know, it's a disease just like any other disease, and it needs to be treated as such. Um, and you start to get a better understanding, you can, you can also better support that individual as well. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you just fine. And I think you make an excellent point. Um, I think that there is, um, there's so much power and empathy and staying curious about our loved one's uh, lived experience. Like um, Andrew mentioned, while his uh, significant other may not have that lived experience, she's still curious and empathetic enough Right. She's still curious and empathetic enough to to want to be of service and a source of support for Andrew. And I think empathy and, and as uh, Brother Gareth mentioned, don't neglect the power of empathy. It goes a long way. Just telling a person that I see you, right, goes a long way. Doesn't mean I have the tools to fix it, but I see you struggling and I'm here. I think that that's so, so powerful. Um, I just wanted to go on because we did have another question. And um, Andrew, you had actually mentioned this. So I'll um, start with you. Um, you talked about how uh, 12 steps had worked well for you. But are there different approaches to recovery besides 12 step programs um, and rehabs? What are some of the options that you're familiar with? Uh, well, so full disclosure, 12 steps saved my life, but I don't attend meetings anymore, right? And that's because my personal, this is personal belief, is that uh, recovery evolves as a person evolves. Uh, people are not static. People change. They have different needs, right? And uh, we're very blessed in that we have a lot of different recovery options to service those needs. I'm very excited because one of the options I see the least is faith-based. Faith-based educated peer recovery services are few and far between. So I'm very, very excited you're filling that gap. gap. But um, if 12 step doesn't work for you, um, it might be the type of 12 step you're in. There's not only Narcotics Anonymous, but there's Alcoholics Anonymous, Pills Anonymous, Heroin Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous. Also, because of my history uh, with friends that used and family that used uh, the, the sister sibling support organizations to these 12 steps, Al-Anon, Naranon, designed specifically for people affected by it are great. You also have Smart Recovery, uh, which is an open-ended uh, recovery resource. I highly recommend everyone looks into it. Um, and you, you have your clinical and your peer recovery resources. Um, highly, highly recommend looking up just random recovery support groups that meet virtually. They're all over Google and you can just pop in, keep your camera on, hear what you wanna hear and uh, say what you wanna say and move on. But there, there are as many different options for recovery as people. Some of them are few and far between, um, but they are there. You just have to take the time to look. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think you have to find what works for you. When I first was introduced to a 12 step program, I was kind of skeptical when I was looking at the steps because, you know, um, I'm agnostic. 
when I'm highly spiritual. And I thought it was more religious program, but then I, I realized it wasn't. It depends on your comp- what you comp- see, what you believe in, what you don't believe in. But I made it work for me. In the beginning, I used what, what I felt that I could use. I, I, I compared to having a, um, a, a, a going to someone's house for dinner and there's something on the plate that I may not like. So I just take what, I just eat what I want. I eat what I like off the plate. And that's how I approached the 12-step program until I really started to implement it in my life. Um, and I still go to 12-step meetings. Actually, I chair two meetings a week, you know, and, and I'm always involved in service. And I, that, that, keeps me, that, keeps me, that keeps me going. Uh, it really works. And I doubted it at first. You know, I really did. When I first looked at it, I, I, I doubted it. But it really works. And there's other alternatives, you know, as well. And I, I and I encourage people to, to to do what works for them, but also go for the experience and see if you like it or not. That's that's what that's the suggestion I give most people. I, I think, and I think that that's so true. I think both you and Andrew are making some excellent points. Um, because I work for um, uh, an insurance company, I, I work for um, oh, I'm trying to I can't even remember the acronym United Healthcare. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, who do I work for? Uh, because I work for an insurance company, one of the things that uh, we advocated for um, was one, adding peer support as a value add, uh, as a rider to insurance plans. So it is included now in the state of New York uh, for all uh, Medicaid recipients uh, that are in a particular program called HARP, right? So they do have... Right to a peer, but then they also have access to a peer respite, which is a huge, which is powerful and another modality and another uh, means of, of supporting folks in recovery. Um, peer respite is exactly as it says. Um, it is led by peers and it is a place that you go literally as a um, as a way to mitigate hospitalizations, right? You avoid hospitalizations, you avoid going into uh, treatment and they support you with their lived experience and their skill set in a safe, controlled environment. Um, So I highly recommend that as a a step down from hospitalization for those who um, may need that that extra support too. Um, I think that just for the sake of time, this may be a good place for us to pause and see if we have uh, any questions in the chat. Because I think there was a a few, uh, a couple of questions, Nairi, did you see any? There are no questions in the Sonic, no questions in the chat. Just a lot of dialogue going on and Brother Gareth has been um, blessing us with some links and whatnot for, um, you know, for, for reference. Oh, great. um, Imam Zulkarnin had a question, um, Sister Zainab, Yes, yes. Something that to be. say. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Um, praise God. I didn't, uh, I came in late. May my apologies because I was on another Zoom. Uh, the Hadith, uh, uh, commentary of Hadith with Masjid Sabur. Uh, we, I, I did hear distinctly um, what someone said that the Islamic presence is not really that uh, uh, flagrant or there's the, the uh, programs, Islamic uh, programs from the Muslim programs. But there is a Malati movement, Malati mm-hmm. al-Islam, a movement, and it's based on the 12 steps, but it's based on the 12 steps according to how it relates to Quran and Hadith, the spiritual mm-hmm. aspect of it. And sometimes when we deal with these clinical issues, we leave out the spirituality. And mm-hmm. regardless of what your your religiosity or your religious uh, persuasion, uh, it, it it still offers a- a- answers and 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 uh, solutions and treatments and and comradery, whether you Muslim or not, right. it just comes and it, and they give credit to the twelve steps, but it also incorporates it into what the spirituality of it or whatever the addiction is, as as was pointed out, could be addicted to shopping, eating, um, talking, <laughs> addictions. So yeah. we can deal, and, and it deals with that in this Malati Ul Islamia uh, organization. They meet every weekend in Masjid Sabor, mm-hmm. as well in the Bronx. Uh, uh, it's the seventy does uh, seventy five eight seventy nine eighty five. Um, 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 Bainbridge Avenue, but the address is really public. So I just wanted to point that out that there is a, a, a Islamic group 
that except it's open to all, it's non-denominational, but uh, and it also bases on the 12 steps and the spirituality of Quint Islam. Thank you. I think, I think that that's such an important point. And they've been around for a long, long time. And I know uh, Brother Rashan has mentioned that he wants to link up with them so that we can do some meaningful work, not only in the Muslim community, but as uh, Imam Zul mentioned, uh, in the community at large, because while we are a Muslim organization, we serve humanity, right? As Muslims, we are called to serve humanity. Exactly. Um, and and I think, thank you, Jazakumullah Khair, Imam Zul, for bringing that up, because it's such an important point, because I think that oftentimes when you see a Muslim in front of anything or any sort of religious affiliation in front of anything, it can be a bit uh, uh, arming because you assume that they're only catering to people of their same religion. And um, alhamdulillah, praise God, one of the things that we are really, and what is really important to us is that we are here to serve our community, and that is inclusive of everyone. Um, so thank you. Thank you for bringing up Malati Islam, Islamia. Excuse me. Um, I, I do just want to say, um, yeah. I, from my experience, I do think the Muslim community should be celebrated um, for taking extra steps to mm -hmm. embrace the communities outside them. Because mm -hmm. speaking as a Christian, certain Christian recovery centers are like that. They are mm -hmm. not reaching out beyond uh, their faith or even beyond their particular denomination of faith. Um, and that's something that I always particularly admired other faith communities for. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just kind of thought it was important to point that out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I've, I've actually worked with uh, Baitul Jamaat briefly uh, doing some food pantry work. And, mm -hmm. and the, the people from all walks of life that you see coming to that center and that organization truly is inspiring yes um, i just wanted to point that out and, and you know, just, just kind of share that yes absolutely and, and imam zul and uh his lovely wife jamila they're both on the board of mps and for those of you who may not know for those of you living under a rock Beitul Jama is an organization uh based in staten island but really again serving humanity they are going into the trenches. They do so much from uh, giving out soup. I think it's at the Staten Island Ferry, Imam Zul. Am I mistaken? Right? Tomorrow, every Thursday, 4 o'clock. Free right. hot chicken soup to anybody who wants a hot cup of just chicken soup that my wife, Jamila, she makes it. I, I get credit, but alhamdulillah, <laughs> I'm giving her her due respect. Um, and, and we're there every Thursday in the Staten Island Ferry giving free hot chicken soup to anyone who wants it. We usually have about maybe seven to ten homeless waiting for us. And right. then everyone else is passing and they get a hot cup of chicken soup free. Uh, and one of our, our slogans is we serve humanity. Mm -hmm. That's it. We serve humanity. Right. Okay, where you from? And, you know, thank you uh, for really, you know, um, being a part of this, having this forum. May God bless you all and bless us all in our work and make us successful. I mean, I mean, I mean, thank Mr. Zainab, you. Yes, we do you have some questions that I did oversee. I apologize. Would you mind, uh, um, would you mind reading them? That's okay. Yeah, sure. Tahir, I apologize, sweetie. Um, she did ask, can the host speak to what is entailed in becoming a counselor as well? What is the training like? To becoming um, a, a counselor or a peer support specialist? Yes, I'm sorry. I had the wrong, wrong semantics. I apologize. No, okay. <laughs> hey, Tahira, no problem. Um, so to become a New York State certified uh, peer support specialist, you do have to go through APS, which is the Academy of Peer Services. It's about uh, 13 core courses uh, that you need to complete. This is 100% free now. It is subsidized by OMH. Presently, so I encourage everyone, um, if you have lived experience, to go ahead and become a peer support specialist. The training is 100% free. Um, at the end of each uh, course, there is an exam. You must score an 80 or above um, in order to to uh, get credit for that course. Um, and again, as I mentioned, you complete 13 core courses. Then after that, I believe you need um, two letters of reference. And then you need to have about either 200 or 2,000, uh, Nari or uh, Brother Rashan, you guys can speak to the amount of hours you need uh, to become certified. Now, that's a provisional certification. If you want full certification, I believe on top of the 13 core courses, there are an additional five courses that need to be taken. 
Am I mistaken, Andrew? I see I get a thumbs up. Is that correct? I five and gave the thumbs up. It's 500, okay. 500 yeah. hours. 500 hours. Okay. Okay. Very good. So 500 hours. I apologize, Sahira, um, of, of work uh, as, a, as a peer. So that's usually uh, voluntary working within the community, um, just someone that can sign off on your time as um, a working peer. Um, this is Barrett, Community Health Action of Staten Island, 56 Bay Street, are mm -hmm. almost always hiring for senior peer mentors. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're looking to get your feet wet and get in the field, that's how I got my 500 hours and I got it paid to do it. So Awesome. Look at all these resources we have in our community. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I remember you, I remember you on the bus stop when we was giving away that soup, man. Been a minute since I've seen you, man. God bless you, my brother. <laughs> God bless you. Good to see you too. Yes, yeah. There and I, I actually quick. took a lot awesome. of that chicken home. It was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I'm I have another question, if I may. Yes. Um, again from Tahera, also interested in commentary about how to augment the infusion of integrative methods of faith-based therapy resources to those in need. What are some ideas in circulation and efforts growing to increase access to faith-based me faith methods? Okay, so I'm gonna defer this question to um, Sister Nairi or Brother Hazek to um, answer. And then also Andrew, because I know that you come from a, a faith-based organization as well, you can possibly speak to to that. Okay, so I'm sorry, there was a kind of a lengthy question. But um, from what I got from it was she wanted to know how we integrate faith based organizations. No, I'm, um, I'm just yeah. asking about faith based integrated efforts that are underway. Um, because within the Muslim community, or those who are newly converted, let's say to Islam, like, uh, how do they seek out this sort of integrative approach in addition to the 12 steps? Like if they, if they kind of need that added support through their recovery process, I'm just kind of asking about like, you know, how does, how does one seek out that and what sort of growth is happening in, in terms of like integrative approaches to managing addiction, offering um, therapeutic services for addiction that is specifically faith-based. Um, our organization's trying to also collaborate, let's say, with chaplaincy um, organizations or, you know, kind of enable chaplains to also become, you know, skilled in these, uh, these methods of, you know, that specific subset, let's say, of um, clients that they may um, be offering services to. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate you uh, clarifying the question a little bit. So yes, absolutely. So all of the uh, organizations that are represented here uh, at this event are, are doing uh, not the same work, but very similar work, right? So you have Beitul Jamal, which is uh, based in Staten Island, and they do a lot of work around uh, different modalities for, for treating recovery. For, so for example, Imam Zul does drumming therapy and therapy through the arts. Um, I, forgive me if I'm, I'm not saying the name of the art. Is it therapy through the arts, uh, Jamila? Uh, drum therapy, art therapy, and Tai Chi. Right. Those are the three uh, different things that they do. My organization, MWI, we also we offer mental health counseling. I'm a mental health counselor um, as well as a recovery specialist. So we do that as well while infusing our while utilizing our clinical knowledge, but also infusing Islam, right? Um, and then we also have Brother Gareth, who is um, on our board as well, and he is uh, a chaplain. So again, and he's working as far as I'm aware on his uh, certification to become a peer support as well, to have another tool on his under his tool belt to support Muslims um, and just humanity in recovery. But again, coming from an Islamic lens, we also do a lot of outreach in the community. Like we have a lot of um, events and workshops within your local masajid really speaking to the importance of mental health, uh, behavioral health, which of course, as you know, is um, inclusive of SUD and AUD, substance use and alcohol use, right? Behavioral health is, is, is all of those things. And just bringing awareness, taking the stigma away 
from uh, having Muslims that are in recovery, right? Um, understanding that as Muslims, right? And I'm just speaking to our community right now. It's not uncommon for someone to come in with a substance use um, challenge, right? Or with a mental health diagnosis. We need to normalize this because we are in this society and we are going to be tested just like everyone else with these different things. But it's important that we are offering these services to within our communities. So this is what we, the, the organizations here uh, strive to do. We work very closely with our local massages um, in providing a lot of these different um, services. And as we continue to grow, and bring awareness to these important issues, um, we, we hope that we will, in some meaningful way, normalize um, treating these very real issues that plague our community. I hope I answered your question. And That's alhamdulillah, thank you. Yes, and we have, oh my goodness, how could I forget Brother Sean? No worries, I, I just wanna <laughs> add, um, I mean, you, you covered um, so much of it, and so I'll only just add, um, something small in saying that um you know we're we try to support vo we we're trying to support providers doing the work and also engaging with community groups to as they're naming um the needs that they have um we had been in touch with um a project out of yale university called uh the amani project and I was going through um, my emails as I was hearing this conversation to like um, refresh myself on it. There's a curriculum that some researchers at Yale are developing, and it's it's um, it's meant to give faith-based leaders the tools to um, intervene in substance use situations when parishioners come to them. Um, by really centering wellness and um, like restorative practices. So, um, I mean, just to, to name one example of work that's being done out there in, you know, where tools are being created to empower um, faith leaders to, to do that work and, and get folks to recovery. So just wanted to add that. Thank you, Sean. Um, and Sister Zainab, if I may, um, we have a uh, Sister Yusma who's also been answering some of these questions in the chat as well. And to add, she indicated that uh, she stated that there is more and more evidence to support the importance of integrating community members within the environment of the person who is being served. For example, the primary client might want a local chaplain, priest, imam, spiritual al spiritual advisor to help them understand and navigate their difficulty. Cultural integration, they have found, has maximized therapeutic benefits in conjunction with evidence-based therapeutic methods. And I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Yusma, because you have been answering a lot of the questions in the chat, and I wanted to make notice um, of that. Um, there is also another question by Vincent. Would anyone be able to explain the process of becoming Narcan, Narcan, tr Narcan trained. Um, so, I'm a Narcan trainer. Uh, you can also that 56 Bay Street location. You can walk in there at any time and say, "I would like to be Narcan trained," and they can train you. Um, also, at the YMCA Counseling Service, there are two branches: one in Clifton and one in Eltingville. Uh, they can Narcan train you as well. And that's, you know, Staten Island's end. But uh, if you go on the New York Department of Health uh, website and look up Narcan, or if you go to the Oasis uh, website and look up Narcan trainings, it should give you a comprehensive list of where to go to get trained. I recommend everyone do it. I know someone who was driving down the street and saw someone overdose and saved their life. You know, um, it's quick, it's easy, it's free. Uh, if you can do it, please do it. Absolutely. Great. E excellent. Excellent point. And, and as he mentioned, you can go to the to OMH and Oasis to, to find where you can locally. For those of you that are on Staten Island, he mentioned some great resources there as well. Jamila, were there any more questions in the chat? Um, no, none that I can see. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Yolanda? Oh, Yolanda? Thank you all. This was very informative. We have a grandson in the state of Maryland. If you know of any programs in Baltimore, Maryland, please contact her. 
she would like to be made aware of such. Um, and I think that one was for Nari, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. But other than that, no, I think we're good. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I just wanted to comment on what uh, Sister Yusma had mentioned about this being evidence-based. And as it relates to peer support, which in, in essence is what she's speaking to, it's very important to mention that um, because oftentimes um, one of the reasons you didn't see a lot of peers in the recovery sphere is because they didn't believe that it was effective, right? One of the reasons the buy-in uh, for definitely insurance companies, but even clinicians, is that this is an evidence-based practice, and it has been proven to reduce um, in to reduce hospitalizations and um, relapse. So I always like to highlight that fact because these are not just a bunch of uh, folks, or we are not just a bunch of folks who have progressed in our recovery. The work that we do matters, and it is impactful, and it has been proven to help folks on their recovery journey. Thank you, Zainab. Alhamdulillah. Sister Nari, Brother Hazek. Yeah, I wanted to just uh, thank everyone. Um, so I wasn't able to really participate the way I wanted to. But Alhamdulillah, I think it was very informative. Like, what would the advice be to those who are dealing with children um, who may be dealing with substance use um, disorders and <clears throat> are in denial of it? Um, I'll start and happy to pass it along to anyone. Um, so our coalition, we hold um, workshops um, virtually um, nearly monthly. Uh, we have a workshop called Parents You Matter, and it's um, a quick workshop to give parents the tools to, one, um, like recognize substance use, right? You know your child best, so you know when they're showing behavior that's not normal, not usual, right? When they're behaving out of out of their normal pattern. Um, and so that's maybe one thing you want to be mindful of. Two, um, it's it's perfectly okay to uh, know the, the social circle that your friend, that your children are hanging out with, right? Um, you, you ought to know what those friends like to do, um, where they hang out, how those families um, interact with their children, because, uh, you know, they're learning a lot from them. Um, and then I'll just add one last thing. Try to find, you know, there are opportunities that often present themselves. Maybe you're watching a TV commercial um, or a show and substance use comes up. Use those kind of natural opportunities to talk about these issues with your young people. That way it doesn't have to be awkward and come out of nowhere, but really just come out of a curiosity and um, kind of just emphasizing that, you know, I, I trust you. You trust me. I'm always here for you. But substance use is not OK in this household. And I want to, you know, talk that over with you, like why that is, you know, what are the risks to your health? Um, and I'll pause there and people can add. Uh, thank you so much. Anyone else want to add to that? Um, Brother Gareth? Uh, yeah, I'll add something. Um, I just want to really quickly draw on the story of Adam and Hawa, Adam and Eve, the parents of humanity, peace be upon them both, when they first sinned against Allah. Allah obviously had the, op the opportunity and the option to destroy them, to do whatever, right? Allah chose not to do that. Not only did Allah choose not to obliterate them, right? He did something that was very special because he knew that they had what is known as a nadam, regret for what they did. So because Allah created that special quality of a nadam that exists within all of us as human beings, that regret for doing something negative or doing something dangerous or toxic or reckless. Allah specifically mentions in the Quran that he taught them how to make repentance. He taught them how to get it right because they themselves, they didn't even know how to get back on track. But Allah, out of his mercy and his justice, he didn't just leave them to their devices. He taught them how to make repentance. 
So for us, when we witness someone going through any type of addiction, some people literally have to be taught how to take the first step forward towards recovery. A lot of times us, we audaciously and arrogantly expect people to just kick a habit or quit a habit or, okay, yeah, just go there. No, we have to direct people in a path that they should go. Now, if they choose to not tread in that path, that's on them. But we have an obligation to shift the compass, if you will, right? Because people are obviously, they're doing things as a result of them being misdirected. It's just like when us, if we see someone praying in the wrong tibla, the wrong direction in a mosque, in a masjid, right? Do we just leave them to pray in the wrong direction? No, we try our best to shift them. Now, if they resist the shift, that's on them, right? But at least we give the effort to actually sh- cause the shift. Just like when Muhammad, peeps upon him, mentioned, he said, whomever amongst you witnesses a munkar, an evil, they must change it with their hands. If unable, if incapable, they must speak against it. If incapable, if unable, then they must hate it within their heart. And that is the weakest faith level. So a lot of us, we have the opportunities to create paradigm shifts and we don't. Going back to what I mentioned, a lot of us are addicted to istikbar, apathy. You know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of us don't want to admit it, but sometimes we bask in joy of other people falling and failing. We have to change our own personal culture of how much we care versus how much we don't care. So it really comes back to that because out of Allah's mercy and justice, if we care, Allah is going to give us ways to help other people. But if we don't care, Allah is not going to give us the tools to help other people. And also something I'll end with this that I tell people all the time. It's impossible to help anyone if you deem them to be inferior to you. We have to see every single human being as our human equal whether they're Muslim or not, whether they're going through a trial or not, that's the only way that we're going to help another human being. We have to see them as our human equal. We can't view them as being inferior. It's impossible for us to help anyone if we deem them to be inferior to us. That's it. Yeah, <clears throat> and that's that's a great point. Um, we ran over time because we started late. We had a few more questions, but, you know, alhamdulillah, I think we should close out here. I would like to thank all of the speakers. Excuse me for my, you know, voice and tone, (laughs) but I was going through something for the past week, you know, just trying to recover myself from this sickness. So, but I want to thank everyone. I appreciate all of you for coming through. Um, If there there are any last um, things or information you want to give out, stuff you want to say, like Andrew, you any other information you want to give out? Anything else? Last words? I'm just going to put my phone number in the chat. If anyone needs anything, you can always give me a call, text me. Yusma, can you just say just a quick 30 seconds, you know, hello before we sign off because we have ran over time? Mm. Uh, like everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Yusma. Um, primarily, I work at Staten Island Hospital. Uh, I'm an addiction counselor. I'm a mental health counselor. I've been in the field for for about 10 years now. And uh, just this topic in general, uh, substance use, recovery, mental health, and especially with young people, um, we need to bring our youth back to us. And I I feel like they've kind of just dispersed out into the ether on the internet. And we need to bring our youth back to us. And this is, inshallah, inshallah, an opportunity to do that. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, I hope I can provide, you know, a little bit of useful information to, to everyone here. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Absolutely. And just to close out, <clears throat> just wanted to say that, you know, this, these organizations that came together, you know, with us to start, um, to start MPS, you know, they've already been, you know, well-established in the community and doing their thing. So for us now, we just, actually have to, um, you know, <clears throat> we just want to be that linchpin that, you know, that can expose all of these different individuals to the rest of the population, you know, where everybody had their own niche. MPS, as far as coming into peer, you know, peer support, we can fit into anywhere. 
but then it also allows us to branch out and, you know, use the resources that are already there that these organizations are, are doing beautiful work in. So you have to be, you know, uh, a little bit patient because this is the first of its kind, inshallah, that I've seen so far um, that's not voluntary. You know, um, you know, inshallah, it won't be for long. Um, and it is evidence-based, like the sister Zainab said. So we will be able to, you know, start building insurances so it would be, uh, inshallah, very soon free to the community. And that's what we want to do, be able to go anywhere and eventually start training peer support specialists to go into any of these spaces. Some of the spaces that we wanted to go into was um, dialysis, you know, uh, cancer uh, cancer patients and their recovery and diff and all of the different things that that um, that need peer support. And, and what started it, my wife uh, didn't mention was you know, that my mother had went through a few of these, a few of these issues. And, you know, for me, she told me that one of the things that got her through it was a nurse that actually I went through her, you know, the same cancer that she had, had the same surgery and walked her through and let her know what, um, you know, what the process would be like, you know, and held her hand through the process. And these things, it makes things less scary when somebody's already walked the path. Even though it may be dark for you, they got their light on already. Yeah, you know, so it's a little bit easier. So not to pull on the point, you know, but I'm the latest organization that we're trying to, that we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, bring to the community. Formulate. Yeah, yeah formulate. formulate. Thank you. Um, Solidify it. Yep. All of those, you know, is one is one of those things that we see are very needed. I myself, you know, came out of the prison system with no help. You know, I didn't even know how to get even an ID when I came home. I was in a different state coming home trying to, you know, navigate these things on my own. Just imagine if we had peer services then, you know, or somebody told me about a peer service that I could have went to. that could have walked me through it, made my life a whole lot easier, you know, show me how to do certain things. And, and you know, there's so many niches and things that we can get into um, or niches, however you say that French word. But so many things that we can get into that we're trying to eventually, you know, broaden our horizons and actually want to bring benefit to the community. Hey, mm -hmm. Mr. Butler, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. Um, thank you, know, you I'll Andrew. See, I'll, see, I'll see you at work uh, one of yes. these days. <laughs> thank you, Sean. Thank, thank you, Sean. Assalamu alaikum. Thanks for watching our video. Please subscribe, like, and share at Muslim Peer Services. Assalamu alaikum.